Hi, everyone, and welcome to the sixth episode of Morris Animal Foundation's Animal uh, Webinar Series, Animal News 101. Just let's get the slideshow going. How 100 Horses Are Helping Horses Everywhere Have Healthier Lives. My name is Sean Anderson Vi with the communications team here at the Foundation. As you know, our goal with this series is to cover topics that are of interest to pet owners and animal lovers in general. We get a lot of questions about pet care and animal health here at the Foundation, and we want to share some of our knowledge with you. Hopefully we have some folks returning, but for those of you, those of you who are new to the Foundation, we are a global leader in supporting studies that benefit the health of animals, including cats, dogs, horses, and wildlife. With the help of our generous donors, we fund scientists around the world to do things like develop vaccines, diagnostics, and surgical techniques for serious health issues that animals face. We've been around since 1948 and were founded by Dr. Mark Morris Sr., a veterinarian and pioneer in animal medicine who recognized a need for the need to improve animal health. We'll get to the presentation in a moment, but first we'll go over some housekeeping items. You should see buttons on the right side of your screen for questions, chat, and to raise your hand. If you have a question, please use the question button, but keep in mind we'll save those for the end of the webinar to keep things moving. If you have a technical question, please, uh, we'll do our best to help you uh, behind the scenes. Also, we can't help uh, answer specific veterinary questions about your pet or animal or horse. If you, have animal, if you have any health concerns, please speak to your family veterinarian directly. For today's webinar, we'll start with a pre-recorded presentation followed by a live question and answer session. After we're through, we'll send out, send out a survey about this webinar and would appreciate it if you would fill it out. Tell us what you liked and didn't like about it so we can better tailor future webinars to your needs. You can even help us choose future topics. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending out a link so you can watch it again if you'd like. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Janet patterson Kane, to say a few words. Dr. patterson Kane. Thank you, Sean, and thanks to everyone for joining us for this webinar. Many of you know that Morris Animal Foundation funds research on the health problems of dogs and cats, but you may not have realized that we also are a major source of funding for research on horse health problems. Dr. Carrie Finno, our speaker today, is a highly respected scientist whose research we have funded, and we're really pleased she could join us today. Dr. Finno received her DVM from the University of Minnesota, completed a residency in large animal internal medicine at the University of California, Davis, and is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Dr. Finno elected to pursue a career in translational genetic research with a strong focus on inherited neuromuscular diseases, and she obtained her PhD in 2012 from UC Davis. She is currently an Associate Professor in Veterinary Genetics, and she is the Gregory L. Ferraro Endowed Director of the Center for Equine Health at UC Davis. Whether you're a horse owner or not, I know you're gonna enjoy hearing about the exciting work that she has been leading. From all of us at Morris Animal Foundation, thank you for attending today. Sean, back to you. Thank you. Now let's get to the presentation. So thank you so much. I'd like to actually acknowledge and thank Morris Animal Foundation for the opportunity to present this talk to everyone today. So we're going to be speaking on precision medicine in the horse, um, otherwise known as how 100 horses are helping horses everywhere have healthier lives. And this is just a part of our herd at UC Davis Center for Equine Health who are going to be the main focus of this talk today. So to start with, what is precision medicine? So this is a term that's been used a lot lately, and I just want to talk about this recent case. So this is about a year ago now, where a drug was actually designed and manu manufactured just for this one nine-year-old girl in Colorado. And this drug was actually made to target the specific disease she had based on her genetic makeup and the abnormalities associated with that disease. So this really highlights what precision medicine is. It's actually targeting therapies to a specific individual and that variant of the disease they have. And the definition that is used formally is that precision medicine is the treatment 
or prevention targeted to the needs of the patient. And this is based on their genetics, biomarkers, and phenotypic or their disease presentation that distinguishes patients with similar clinical presentations. And really the effort was pioneered in 2015 with the Precision Medicine Initiative under the Obama administration where funds were directed towards actually investing in precision medicine. And as a result of this, most of us are familiar with targeted therapy and cancer. And this is really one of the areas that's um, gained a lot of headway. Another example would be the use of tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is a drug that's often used to treat breast cancer in women. And what they had found was that actually 65% of women develop resistance to this drug and it becomes ineffective. And when they looked into why this was, it turns out that these women actually have a genetic mutation in the gene CYP2D6. And this gene encodes a protein that breaks down tamoxifen. So these women then cannot break down tamoxifen to its active product and therefore it's ineffective. So they may all have breast cancer and yet there's a subpopulation of women where this particular drug is not going to work. And so they need a different therapy. And now they can actually screen women for this mutation and target therapy accordingly. And then as I alluded to earlier, so cancer is really where precision medicine has taken off and they will actually prescribe specific drugs based on biomarkers that are associated with the cancer you have. So you may have 100 people that have colon cancer, but maybe only a subset of them have a specific marker, in this case, EFGR. And if they have that, they will get a specific treatment. So it's really taking medicine to a much uh, finer way to diagnose and treat disease. So what about in the horse? So the example I have in the horse here is say you have these six horses and they all have superficial corneal ulcers or eye ulcerations, which unfortunately we see pretty often in horses. So your veterinarian comes out, they'll treat them with usually a topical medication, but they'll often also put them on banamine um, as an anti-inflammatory. So flinix and meglamine, the name for the drug banamine, this is the standard dose um, for full anti-inflammatory infects, 1.1 mg per kg orally twice a day. So these six horses get put on the same drug for the same disease. And what you get is you actually have four horses where you have the expected effect. The inflammation goes down, they don't have any side effects, eventually the lesion resolves. You potentially have this one horse here where you actually have no effect. You don't get an anti-inflammatory effect that you would expect at this dose. And then I think even more worrisome to us as horse owners would be this horse where you actually have an adverse effect. So this horse either develops kidney failure or potentially gets severe gastric ulcers, even though the horse is on the recommended dose of banamine and everything else is normal, it has normal access to water, everything else is expected, but this horse, there's something about this horse that makes it more susceptible to this drug and leads to these side effects, which can be pretty devastating. So how do we figure out which horse needs which dose or potentially a different drug. So precision medicine approach would say, okay, well, let's take these same six horses and let's look at biomarkers and let's look at genetics and let's really evaluate them to a, this precise level. Based on those results, these four horses can get that regular dose of banamine. They're gonna be just fine. This horse that we actually had no response in might need either a different drug or a different dose. And this horse that had an adverse effect might need to be put on ketoprofen or a different anti-inflammatory because it's very sensitive to banamine. The goal would be to get a positive effect in all six of those horses, but the therapy is going to differ depending on their makeup and biomarkers. So that's really what we're trying to move towards in veterinary medicine and following what's happening in human medicine. So the other term we need to talk about is systems biology. So how do we get to precision medicine? So the way to do it is actually the systems biology approach. And what this means is you take a single individual and we're going to look at their genetics, so their genes. We're going to look at their phenotype, which is how they look in health, what are their diseases, what are their other traits. And then one thing we all have to really keep in mind is the environment. So where are these horses housed? What is their diet? What is their interaction? What is their travel history? Are they com uh, competing horses? This is another really important factor because all of these interact, right? Genetics and environment 
interact to show us health and disease. So we wanna take a single individual and look at them on all these components. And so this is actually what's called a circus diagram. This is from Dr. Nathan Price, and this is from a human study where they actually took um, a little over 100 people up in Seattle, Washington, and they did this Pioneer 100 project. And what they did was they asked 100 people to come in and over time they collected samples on them. So they collected blood samples, they collected health records, um, they actually wore Fitbits, they collected all of that data on them. And then they also collected fecal samples to look at their microbiome or the population of bacteria in their gut and diet information. And then they ran all of these tests on those 100 people at these multiple time points and they were able to generate these graphs. So what this is here is you have your typical blood work here in red. So clinical labs would be when you go in to just get blood work done. You have your microbiome sequencing. So this is a fecal sample then where they actually look at the bacterial content in your gut here in this gold color. Genetic traits, so they could actually use blood to generate DNA to look at their genetic makeup. Proteomics, so this is their protein biomarker profile. And then metabolomics, so metabolites are um, as your body processes drugs and other things, what gets produced. So in purple here, these were the metabolites they were able to look at. And every blue line is where there's a correlation. So you can see that the clinical labs, a lot of these findings correlate to what was found in the biomarkers in the proteins and the biomarkers in the metabolome. And then we have some here that connect to the genetic traits and a few that connect to the microbiome. But so this is what you're looking at. So in this single individual, and now I'm gonna take this to a horse because that's what we're here to talk about, is we wanna create this correlation to figure out what is involved in what and what would be a biomarker for certain diseases. So now let's apply that plot to a group of animals, right? For each horse generates its own plot. And then you can actually look at those horses and see, you know, do they have Cushing's? Do they have other diseases? Can we link all of this that we're finding to the disease that's naturally developing in these horses? And then the other really powerful part of this is not just looking at this at one time point. So as these horses age, so you have your healthy horse here, five or six year old, as this horse ages, can we take repeated measurements and see what changes. And as things develop, what's actually changing in these, what we call multi-omic approaches, where you have proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, look at all of that together over time. So this um, really interesting study that occurred again up in Washington in the Pioneer 100 human population also was able to do this very interesting thing called calculating biologic age. And so what they were able to do is use all of those biomarkers to say, okay, based on your biomarker profile, how old are you? So um, this was the data they actually came up with. So they had quite a few individuals for this data set. It was published uh, last year. So in this example, I'm just going to hypothetically say I'm 25, um, which I'm not, but chronologically, so my actual age is 25. So based on my blood work based on my protein profile, based on my metabolome, and then compiling all that data together. If I'm 25, where do I fall on here? Is my biologic age younger? Um, does it think that I'm 20 because everything is good? Or unfortunately, could I be up here and be 25, but my biologic age is closer to 50? Um, in which case there's some worrisome biomarkers there that I could change my diet, my environment, things that are going in order to try to bring that number down. So this is a really uh, just an interesting approach. And if you think about taking this to the horse, right, say we have that 15 year old um, upper level competitor in whatever discipline you're interested in, is that horse's biologic age eight, you know, and that horse is going to compete till it's 18 or 19 because everything is heading in the right direction. Or do we have a horse that is nine years old and struggling um, at the level we expect it to be at? And maybe there are some biomarkers that say that horse is older than it should be. So it's a really interesting way to think about this. And I actually, as an anecdote, recently bought a scale, um, which has an app with it. And when you weigh yourself, it gives you body water content, muscle mass, all of these other things, but it also tells you your biologic age based on those measurements.
events. So it, it's something that's coming into play, I think, for us as people um, in a lot of these gadgets and apps that are out there. And But this is a way to do it on a very, very powerful kind of, again, multi-omics level. So this brings us to the Pioneer 100 Horse Initiative. So our goal was to effectively take that study they did in people and do this in horses. So we want to create this scientifically sound and the goal is to create a wellness program, right? If we can use these tools, can we prevent disease rather than be kind of catching up and trying to treat it? And so we are incredibly fortunate at UC Davis in that we have a herd of horses that are used for teaching. Um, so this is one of our mares here, and this was the pre-pandemic days, of course, um, where all the first-year students would come out and learn how to do physical examinations on a horse. And so these horses live at the center. Um, they were donated for various reasons, but we have uh, access to all their medical records. We feed them, you know, certain diets. So we actually, as far as the environment goes, it's very controlled in a population of horses, as opposed to client-owned horses that can be in different barns and different environments. So our goal with these 100 horses is to get these multi-omic approaches. So the first thing we did this past year, and this was through support of Platinum Performance, was to perform whole genome sequencing. So we actually sequenced the entire genome of these 100 horses, and we have that data already available. We were fortunate enough to collaborate with Dr. Horvath at UCLA. He was looking at an epigenetic marker. So epigenetics is the interaction of DNA and proteins. And this, in this case, it was methylation. And he was looking at this across species to see, um, again, there's a little bit of a biologic aging mechanism here for how much methylation occurs in your DNA. So we actually had the opportunity to go ahead and perform this on these same horses. So we have this data already complete. The proteome, um, we have a subset of horses that we're looking at for neurodegenerative disease and healthy horses. So we're looking at some markers, um, within their blood to see what's going on as far as neurodegeneration goes, so nervous system disease. Metabolome, um, we had a collaboration that we were actually able to obtain plasma samples and run this, so we have that complete. And then we've been um, fortunate enough to obtain some funding through a collaborative effort between UC Davis and UC Dublin in Ireland to do some microbiome sequencing in these horses. So that's looking at, again, that bacterial content in the gut by taking a fecal sample and doing sequencing there. So the other information we have on these horses, which you need to do these studies, is what's called deep longitudinal phenotyping. So deep in that we're gonna take lots of um, parameters on these horses. Longitudinal means we take it over time. So we don't just do one time point, we do it again as these horses age. And then phenotyping is we're looking for health markers and disease markers, at least what we can see clinically. So this is again, a pre-pandemic picture. This is our um, ophthalmology group. Um, this is Dr. Nickelbein here, and they've actually come out and done full optho exams on this entire herd. Um, so we actually have uh, very extensive ophthalmic exams, again, over time in these horses. We also have access to their medical records. Again, we feed them so we know what they eat. Um, we've weighed them. We have body condition scoring or BCS. We have their heights measured. Um, we also have full heart evaluations or cardiac evaluations on these horses. So we have one of our uh, faculty at UC Davis, Dr. Jessica Morgan, who actually brings our residents and students out and is able to teach them ultrasound of the heart using this herd. And in the same time or at the same measure, we are gaining all of that information on each horse. Um, looking at parasitology, so kind of deworming protocols, I'm sure many of you are familiar with doing fecal egg counts in horses rather than just doing a deworming system you actually take fecal egg counts and determine who are high and low shedders and that is likely to be there's a genetic basis for that um, so we have fecal egg counts on these horses full blood work so a complete blood count or cbc chemistry um, acth is what we look at um, for cushing's disease we have in these horses and then lipid profiles. We also have um, vitamin concentrations and minerals in many of these horses. And then again, getting this blood sample to do the metabolome to look at all the metabolites similar to what they did in that human study. So I think the other thing that's really unique about this group of horses is that because they are teaching horses and because they're maintained by UC Davis, we have additional information on them that's kind of a bonus. 
Um, so a subset of these horses is part of the herd that Dr. Heather Knitch uses to look at um, drug metabolism in horses. And these are thoroughbreds that have come off the racetrack. Um, they're exercised on the treadmill here at UC Davis. And she can look at metabolism of certain drugs. And the reason for this is to kind of drive drug testing protocols at the racetrack. But the other side of this is she's actually been able to go through a large portion of these 100 horses and to see how they metabolize banamine. So if we go back to that example I showed you about the horse with the corneal ulcer, and they, six of them get banamine, four of them respond. We've actually looked at this data and there are subsets of horses that metabolize banamine very, very quickly. So those horses are probably not going to get the response you want from a regular dose of banamine because they are effectively blowing through it. On the flip side, you have horses that are very slow metabolizers. So these are horses that you worry that that banamine level is staying up too high and they could have toxic effects. So genetically, if we can separate them out, we could target dosing accordingly. This also plays a role in drug testing. So if you have a horse that metabolizes banamine very, very slowly, potentially, even if that horse had banamine within the allowed time, you know, whether it's racing or um, competing uh, hunter jumper events, it could potentially test positive um, and it's because it's a slow metabolizer. So it actually would help us understand that a lot better. The other thing we have access to is all of these horses have been blood typed. So all of these 100 horses have the opportunity to be blood donors for our horses that come into UC Davis that are client owned that may have problems requiring a blood transfusion. So we know all their blood types, um, which is really unique. We also know their vaccine history. And then Dr. Pesterla here and Dr. Wilson um, have done studies over the years looking at vaccine responses. So similar to what we talked about with drug administration, a lot of these horses we have titers on. So say you gave a horse a rabies vaccine um, and that horse responded really well, had a high titer for years, but you gave another horse the same rabies vaccine and it's a poor responder. It doesn't, for whatever reason, it doesn't respond as well. So that horse needs to be vaccinated more often than the other horse. And again, this is gonna come back to that precision approach. Perhaps we can take this and say, okay, your horse based on these biomarkers should get vaccinated for rabies every year, or we can maybe revise it to say you could go every few years because this horse is tighter lasts a long time. So looking at vaccination protocols, and a lot of us have had that, um, unfortunate incident where you vaccinate a horse and they're really sensitive and they have these side effects. And so could we help guide vaccination on a per horse basis? And then finally, you know, we've had the opportunity to develop a lot of new technologies at UC Davis, um, the most recent being this standing PET scanner. So PET is the positron emission tomography unit. Um, and what this does is I kind of think of this as a a functional x-ray, so to speak. So it's not really the technology, but you're kind of looking at an area of the limb. In this case, um, this horse's leg here, they're imaging the knee or the carpus. And this machine, um, this was the prototype that we developed um, in conjunction with Brain Bio. And this is Dr. Mathieu Sprier here who worked with that company. So this particular machine, if this horse were to take a step backwards, it opens, um, so it's very safe but you can image pretty much the lower limb on these horses. And then what you'd see, you can see in the image up here on the right that Dr. Galupo is pointing towards is you see this really bright quote unquote hot spot. So it's kind of telling you, it's a little bit like a bone scan, but to a much more specific degree, it's telling you where the area of inflammation or remodeling is occurring. And this was actually developed for use on the racetrack. Um, to kind of screen horses that potentially could have injuries if they were raced and also in the sport horse world. So we um, are going to be having a standing pet at UC Davis, but these Pioneer 100 horses actually tested the prototype out. So in doing that and helping us understand how to use this machine, we actually also gain data on them. So we have this in information as well. So this is just, again, this additional um, phenotype information that we have on these animals. And to kind of finish up, I just want to give you an example, um, just, to, just to show how powerful this really can be. So this is Liberty. So Liberty was donated, um, he was 16 years old when he was donated to us. 
And he was donated because the owners could not get weight on this horse. And I think everyone here can appreciate um, what poor condition this guy is in, you know, so he's really skinny, but the also the thing to notice really is this profound muscle atrophy. So this is a percher on gelding, right? He should not um, have all of these bony processes here. And the problem was, is that he couldn't pick up his feet for the farrier, he'd start shaking, and then he actually couldn't back up to the hitch. Um, and so they used him for driving and he, they found over time that they really couldn't get him to back up. Um, so I'm gonna play this video just to show you um, the difficulty he has backing up. This is Dr. Vio out at the center. Um, I'm going to mute it just so we keep the video on mute. Um, and you can kind of see he can get started as he backs, but I want you to pay attention up here to the tail and the hindquarters and you'll see his trembling and that he becomes very, very reluctant after a few steps. That's great. So, and Dr. Vio is strong, but it's very hard to push a, a perch on backwards. It doesn't want to go backwards. So I hope you could all appreciate the trembling that was occurring and how reluctant he was to do this. So one of the things we did was to actually measure his vitamin E concentration. So um, Dr. Vio recognized that this is kind of one of the areas I do research in is looking at vitamin E in horses and a vitamin E deficiency can lead to these signs. So his vitamin E was what's considered normal. It was at the low end of normal. So it was two. Um, and the reference range here is two to five. But based on the signs and based on the fact that it was low and his, um, again, this trembling and this really kind of classic inability to back up, we went ahead and took muscle biopsies. And you take muscle biopsies just here from the top of his tail to try to get to a diagnosis. And um, Dr. Valerie was kind enough to read these out. And so this is just showing you on the left here, this is a normal muscle biopsy with a specific stain from a healthy horse. Um, and these are muscle fibers here. This on the right um, was from Liberty. And so I think you can appreciate there's these white holes in the middle of these muscle fibers. Um, we'll kind of call these these moth-eaten fibers. And this is very characteristic of this disease called vitamin E deficient myopathy or myopathy would be a muscle disease associated with vitamin E deficiency. So the good news for Liberty is that um, this is reversible at this stage. And so what we did was we actually put him on um, this dose of natural vitamin E orally once a day for eight weeks while he was out at the center. And without changing his diet, without doing any exercise, within eight weeks, he went from this to this, um, which is pretty impressive with just fixing his vitamin status. Um, and I think what really um, excited us was that we could now actually have him uh, stand for the farrier and be able to pick his feet up. And then this is him backing again, eight weeks after treatment. So this was really exciting um, and everybody has subsequently fallen in love with Liberty. So he's a member of the herd and he is um, included in the pioneer study. Uh, and then I routinely now get sent um, these videos. So this was a horse that didn't want to move before. So this was really exciting. Um, but then what I did was I went ahead and checked his vitamin E level. So we'd supplemented him. Remember, he was at two in his blood. So I wanted to see where he was now. And when I did that, he was way up at eight. So remember, the normal range is two to five. So eight is too high. Um, and there are consequences associated with too much vitamin E deficiency or too high of a level of vitamin E. So because of this, I actually reduced his dose. So instead of 10 units, um, I actually put him down to five units. 
just to see. I brought his level back down to normal. So now he was about five. However, the signs came back. So, and it was pretty quickly. He couldn't back up again. He was trembling again. So this horse, despite the fact that we say the normal reference range is two to five for vitamin E in the blood of horses, this horse needs to be at eight for whatever reason. There's probably a genetic reason. There's something going on where he requires more vitamin E than your typical horse. So as soon as we bumped him back up to this dose, he looked great again. Um, so this is an example of in this specific case that that prescriptive, here's normal vitamin E doesn't work. He needs more. Um, and if we had some markers of this, this would really help us to determine which horses require this. So just to close again, showing the same slide I showed earlier, this is our goal is to take those horses that require a certain drug for a certain disease and be able to specifically target therapy on a horse by horse basis to get a positive effect in all of these horses without any potential toxic side effects. And so with that, I'd like to close by acknowledging um, the team that's been behind this. So this is Dr. Callan Donnelly, who is the graduate student that is really uh, leading this entire initiative and really grateful to have him on the team. Um, this is Dr. Mulcahy from um, UC Dublin. And again, this has now been a collaborative effort between UC Davis and then UC Dublin. They call it UCD squared. Um, so we're really fortunate to have the team from Ireland that's an interested in the parasitology side of things. So the deworming protocols. Dr. Nathan Price um, is the investigator that led the study in humans. And we've actually been able to talk him into getting excited about looking at this in horses. Um, so this has been wonderful. And then Mark Herthel, um, who's the platinum, really helped us get the whole genome sequencing going. And then we've been fortunate enough to have some funding from Almo Pintado Foundation to go ahead and do some proteomics um, looking at neurologic disease. And so with that, I'd really like to thank everybody for their attention today. I hope I um, encourage people to be as excited about this as I am. And I think we'll follow up with any questions. Okay, well that does it for this presentation. We'd like to thank Dr. Carrie Finno for recording this session to tell us about the Pioneer 100 Horse Initiative and what it could mean for horse health and precision medicine in general. And I'd like to thank our viewers today. We hope you found it interesting and helpful. We also hope you'll join us next month when we talk about pain management in dogs and cats. Until then, we'll see you next time. Stay safe and have a great day.